I'm going to take it that you guys can. All right, perfect. So uh, thank you guys for all showing up. <laughs> Another Civi 398 seminar. And in this seminar, we're going to be talking about assignment number seven. Now, what's nice about assignment number seven, only two questions. So in theory, this should be a nice, quick, easy assignment for you guys. One of the problems, though, is both of these questions rely upon Mathematica. And of course, if you guys do even the littlest things wrong in Mathematica, it quickly becomes a nightmare. So hopefully I can clear up all the tricks and tips for Mathematica so this can be a nice, easy assignment for you guys. Talking to the previous uh, seminar session, you guys have a lot of midterms. So hopefully this assignment isn't a bother for you guys. I already have the videos up for this assignment. And uh, unlike the seminar you guys will see today, I go much more in depth on the Mathematica. So hopefully, again, this assignment is a piece of cake for you guys. That's my goal today is to make this as easy as possible for you guys so you guys can focus on your midterms and not really care too much about this assignment. So let's begin. Question number one says, a beam has a length L of 11 meters and a rectangular cross section whose width and height are 274 millimeters and 310 millimeters and it's subjected to a downwards distributed load Q of 142 kilonewtons per meter. It says the Young's modulus of the material is 20 GPA and the effect of Poisson's ratio can be ignored. For both a simple end condition and a fixed end condition determine A, the deflection function in meters, the shear function in newtons, and the bending moment function in newton meters as a function of X1. So as you guys will see, this part A of the question, this is going to be the big one. If we get part A wrong, then the rest will actually be wrong. So we're going to pay a lot of attention to part A. This is the meat and potatoes, if you will, of this question. Uh, part B says the stress components sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2 as a function of x1 and x2. So there's going to be a difference right there. For the deflection function, the shear function, and the bending moment function, if you guys do it right, of course, they should only be a function of x1. However, those two stress components will be a function of both x1 as well as x2. And it wants these functions in terms of Pascal, so just PA. Uh, part C says the location and value of maximum sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2. And we're going to talk about that. That'll be nice and easy. And part D wraps up with the location and value of the maximum von Mises stress. So von Mises stress, you guys have seen a lot before. That won't be a problem. The major problem that you guys will face or that I'm anticipating from the assignment is this. If we look at the units given in the question, we're given a wide variety of units. For instance, the length is in meters. However, the cross-sectional dimensions are in millimeters. Our distributed load Q is in kilonewtons per meter. And our Young's modulus is in GPA. However, if we look at what the question wants us to have, it wants us to have all our answers in solely meters, newton meters, and pascals. So for all of those things that we have up there, what we're going to want to do is convert them into the equivalent units before running the analysis. And we'll see that more when we get into Mathematica. So the question becomes, all right, what relationships do I have to solve this question? So again, part A, this is going to be the big part of the assignment where we want that deflection function, the shear function, and the bending moment function. So before we get into the Civi 398 part, let's take a step back to Eng 130 because when we did the shear diagrams and the bending moment diagrams, we used the following relationships to make it nice and easy for us. And that was if I have my distributed load Q, well, then my shear is simply the integral of that distributed load. So typically our Q would be a nice constant distributed load. I integrate that, I get a nice linear shear function. And we took it one step further and said, all right, well, if we want the moment function, all we have to then do is integrate our shear function and we were able to obtain our moment function. So this was from Eng 130, it was nice and simple. And it gave you guys a really nice quick way to find those diagrams without having to do too much work. Now what we're going to do in Civi 398 is go a little bit crazier, take it one step further and saying, all right, well, if I'm going from relationship to relationship simply by integrating, what happens if I integrate the moment function? Well, as you guys will see, if we integrate that moment function and then divide by a value of EI, which we call the flexural stiffness, we get the rotation function. So this is going to be the rotation of the cross section throughout the beam. And if we go one step further, we can find the deflection function, where the deflection function is simply the integral of that rotation function. So as we can see, we have a lot of nice relationships here. And the key to it is basically just integrating. We go from shear to moment to rotation, all the way down to deflection. Now, this is in its most simple form. However, we can 
rearrange these to create three nice relationships, which I recommend kind of jotting down for your midterm or your final, and that is these three relationships right here. So these are going to be the keys to solving this question, these three relationships, and again, these will probably be the key to solving any type of midterm or exam question that you guys will have. So the first one is the shear. So my shear function can simply be found by multiplying EI, which is that flexural stiffness, by the third derivative of our deflection function. Similarly, the moment function can be found by multiplying EI by the second derivative of our deflection function. And then the final one is Q, our distributed load, can be found by multiplying EI with the fourth derivative of our deflection function. So the key I really want to emphasize here is if we have that deflection function, we can solve a lot about this beam. We can find the shear, we can find the moment, we can find the distributed load. Now let's look at our problem. Our problem is a little bit different where we do not have that deflection function. However, we are given the distributed load. So if I look at that last relationship that I still have highlighted in green, we can actually determine that deflection function. Because if we look at the left hand side, it's simply Q and we know what Q is. If we look at the right hand side, EI, the flexural stiffness, we can find out what that is. That's no problem. And then the deflection function or the fourth derivative of that deflection function, we don't know but it is our only unknown in this equation, so therefore we can solve for that deflection function, which is great because once we know that deflection function y, we can use the two relationships above to quickly find both the shear and the moment function. So this is going to be part A. So let's take a look at trying to solve that differential equation. As I said, the equation that we're going to be using for part A is Q is equal to EI multiplied by that fourth derivative of that deflection function. Now this kind of seems to be a problem because the question wants us to consider two cases. A beam with simple end conditions, so basically two pins, or a beam with fixed end conditions, so both of the ends are fixed. Now if we look at this equation right here, there isn't a parameter that says, oh, if it's simple, use this, oh, if it's fixed, use this. We don't really have that. All we have is the distributed load, EI, and EI is more of a cross-sectional value, and then the deflection function. So the question becomes, well, how do we change this to consider a simple end condition or a fixed end condition? Well, of course, the answer is going to be boundary conditions. Usually I'd have a little bit more lead up to this, but uh, you guys have seen differential equations in depth now. You guys know that, of course, they're going to have boundary conditions. So if I were to solve this equation exactly how it is on the screen, I would get this right here, where EI times that deflection function is basically going to be a function of C1, C2, C3, and C4. Now we're going to use these boundary conditions to figure out what these values of C are. For instance, if I have a simple boundary condition, the values of C will be different than if I have a fixed boundary condition. So this is how we simplify it into uh, accounting for our end conditions. So again, are these boundary conditions will allow us to solve for our C coefficients. So this is going to be the key here again for part A. We're going to imp implement our boundary conditions find the deflection function, and then once we have our deflection function, we can quickly solve for a shear and moment. Now, if we move on to part B, it begins to ask, all right, well, now that we have all those functions, what are the stress components? Well, the stress components in an Euler-Bernoulli beam are actually quite simple. So if we define our x1 axis to run through the centroid of the beam, which is going to be key, sigma 1, 1, our stress component sigma 1, 1, is simply negative my divided by i. Now, again, if we define our x1 axis to run through the centroid of the beam, this can be simplified to negative m, where m is our moment function, we found that in part a, no problem, multiplied by x2, which is going to simply just be x2, we don't need any modification, all divided by i, where that i is the moment of inertia, and again, we know that from the question, we can figure it out from the cross-sectional properties. So, once we have that moment function, it's just plug and chug to find sigma 1, 1, it's going to be no problem at all. How about the stress component sigma 1, 2? Again, it's a very simple formula where sigma 1, 2 is equal to negative VQ divided by I times B. However, since we defined our X1 axis to run through the centroid of this beam, it can be simplified into negative V, which is the shear function, again found in part A, multiplied by H over 2 minus X2, where H is the height of the beam, X2 is simply X2, multiplied again by x2 divided by 2 plus h over 4 and then multiplied by b where b is that in plane thickness so again if we had it in 2d it'd be that thickness into the page and then we divide this by ib where of course i is the moment of inertia 
and b is going to be that in plane thickness. So as we can see, after we have our moment function and our shear function, both the stress components sigma 1 1 and sigma 2 2 are actually pretty easy. We just have to plug and chug all the way through. So again, I want to emphasize this. These simplifications that we made, mainly for y in sigma 1 1 and q in sigma 1 2, this is because we defined our x1 axis to run through the centroid of the beam. If Dr. Samer in a midterm or a final gives you a defined coordinate system where let's say the x1 axis is below the beam, something like that, well then you're going to have to manually solve for both uh, y and q in that case, but it's not too difficult. Or I'm sure Dr. Samer wouldn't be that mean. <laughs> All right. So now that we have sigma 1, 2 and sigma 1, 1, we can solve for uh, part B and we can solve for part C. Looking at part D, <laughs> looking at part D, the last thing that it wants is, of course, the von Mises stress. So this is something you guys are very familiar with. We know that our sigma von Mises is this nice long equation. However, luckily for us in an Euler Bernoulli beam under these circumstances, we know that sigma 2, 2 is equal to sigma 1, 3, equal to sigma 2, 3, and equal to sigma 3, 3, which is equal to 0. And because of that, a lot of the terms in that equation cancel. Therefore, we can simplify our von Mises stress into simply the square root of sigma 1, 1 squared plus 3 times sigma 1, 2 squared. Looking at that formula, it's just a function of sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2, which we know from part B slash part C. So we're good to go. We just have to simplify. So that's going to be the question as a whole. However, when we deal with these questions in Mathematica, or at least how I like to deal with them personally, I like to write down the steps. Because if I have the steps, well, then when I go to Mathematica, I know exactly what order I need to code things in. So the question steps in Mathematica for me would be, of course, to find the parameters. This seems like a no-brainer to you guys. You guys are thinking, well, of course, I need those parameters to solve the question. And then in this question, we can go right into that differential equation for deflection. So again, everything that we need in this question is dependent on that differential equation for the deflection, which I call y as a function of x1. So in order to do this, I need to do two things. The first one is, of course, going to be defining that differential equation that I want to solve. And the second thing, of course, to solve it completely is we need to define the boundary conditions of that equation. So it's not too bad, nothing you guys haven't seen before. And again, this is the key, because after we have that deflection function, we can carry out the rest of the steps very simply. So after we know that, we need the shear and the bending moment function. Again, that's easy, it's just going to be EI multiplied by some sort of derivative of that deflection function. And once we know the shear and bending moment functions, we can determine the stress components sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2. And if we know sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2, we can solve for that von Mises stress. So again, the only real difference here when we're considering our two conditions, because again, if we look at the question, we want to consider both a beam with simple end conditions and a beam with fixed end conditions. The steps for both of those are going to be exactly the same. The only thing we're going to modify, of course, are going to be the boundary conditions. Modifying those boundary conditions accounts for the different fixities at the end of the beam, and we're going to be good to go. So if you guys do the question or the code for the question really good for the simple end conditions, well, it's going to be very simple to modify it for the fixed end conditions. So let's talk about uh, this in Mathematica. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the PowerPoint right now, and we're going to go into Mathematica. So of course, on my right hand side here, I have all the parameters for my question, as well as my differential equation as well as the relationships. And on the left-hand side, I got my Mathematica ready to go. We're going to define the parameters together. We're going to solve the differential equation together. And then we're going to determine the shear and bending moment functions. Of course, due to time constraints of this seminar, we won't get into the stress components. But as you guys remember, they're pretty easy. However, in my video on YouTube showing this question, I do go into the stress components. So don't worry if you guys are having trouble. There are resources out there to help you guys. All right, so again, we're going to consider the fixed end condition case. And what I'm going to do instead to try and get you guys involved is I'm going to write stuff down and I'm going to ask you guys, did I write it correct or did I write it incorrectly? So hopefully this will help you guys solve this question. So if we look at question number one, we have our parameters here on the right, and this comes directly from the question. And what we need to do is define these parameters into Mathematica. So the first one I want to find is EM which I define as the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus. And in the question, we are given that that value of E is 20 GPA. So if I want to, I can go EM is equal to 20. 
So what do you guys think? Did I do this correctly or did I do this incorrectly? Um, is, should it be, should you convert the GPA into MPA first? So if we convert it into MPA by adding three zeros, we now have it in MPA. However, for this type of question, would this be the way to go? So I agree that normally I always tell you guys I like all my units in MPA and Newtons and stuff like that. But keep in mind, if we use that convention, all of my answers will, of course, be in MPA. And in the question, it says it wants things in PA. So Janie is right. We need to convert things into PA. Of course, we can solve the question MPA and then convert after, but that's just asking for trouble, in my opinion. It's always best to express all the units in the form of what it wants in the question. So in this question, I want PA, I want Newtons, and I want meters. So if I want to convert this into uh, PA, well, I go, all right, I got 20,000 MPA. I add three zeros. I got KPA. I add three more zeros. I got PA. But doesn't this look a little funny? Like, that's a really big number. So are you sure? What do you guys think? Like, doesn't that look real mean to put in a question a number that big? Are you guys confident? Maybe not so confident. All right, well, let's just leave it and we'll move forward. How about the length? It says over here that my length is equal to 11 meters. So I'm just simply going to put 11. Are you guys happy with that? Yes, Dylan, Dylan says we're happy. Perfect. So if anything goes wrong, we'll blame Dylan. That's great. Uh, B, which is that in plane thickness, I'm given as 274 millimeters. So that's going to be 274. But of course, I know I want this in meters. So I'm going to go 0 0.274. Oops. What do you guys think? Johnson says yes. Anybody else? Are we confident too? All right, well, I'll assume that you guys are nice and confident, and we'll talk about that after. The height, we're given the height is 310 millimeters. So I'm just going to go 0 0.310. We're good to go with the height. Looks good. All right, so Q, our distributed load, we are given that is 142 kilonewtons per meter. So we just go 142. What do you guys think? So Johnson says base units. So what would I have to do to transform this into what I want? So Dylan says multiply by 100. So if I had two zeros, are we good to go? Oh, Dylan says 1,000. So is everybody happy now? Yes. All right, perfect. We have Q as 142,000 newtons per meter. And now we have a rectangular cross section. So what would be my formula in terms of base and height? for the moment of inertia, which I called IG. We have a nice rectangular cross section. All right, Dylan says base times height cubed divided by 12. That is absolutely correct. So base times height cubed, and then we divide that by 12. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run this output. So we got our moment of inertia is equal to this right here. Now, this is a decimal number. Does the assignment like decimal numbers? What do you guys think? If I were to input an assignment, a decimal number into the assignment, do you think the assignment's going to mark it wrong? So Janie says that we need to input this in a fraction. So how do we find this in a fraction? We have it in a decimal component, which is great. However, how do we put this into a fraction? 
So again, we have a decimal. How do we get this formula into a fraction? I'm asking this one specifically because this caused the most troubles in the previous Mathematica questions. So Janie says that we should input our base as a fraction instead of a decimal. So let's do that. 274 divided by 1,000, that's equivalent. If I run this, oh, I still have a decimal. So it was a good idea, but are we missing something? Same for H. All right, so let's do that. Instead of 0 0.310, we go 310. We'll divide that bad boy by 1,000. Oh, what do you know? We have a fraction now. So this is going to be the key when we're doing these algebraic expressions in the assignment. All of our inputs in the equation must be fractions in order to get the output as a fraction. Now, why I say this is because before when we deal with Poisson's ratio as 0.3, a lot of the students in their Mathematica put 0.3, and then all their outputs were in nasty decimal numbers, and this caused a lot of confusion. So, of course, it's always best to input things as fractions, and then you'll get it as a fraction. So these are all of our parameters. Are you guys, are you guys comfortable with them? Are they looking pretty good? Are we ready to move on to the next step? All right, we got we got confirmation that we can go to the next step, so this will be nice and easy. So the next step will be defining our differential equation. So you know me, I like to take this differential equation and I like to define it as a simple equation. So what I'm going to go is my differential equation, which I just put as DE, is going to be equal to EI, so EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of that deflection function. So if I define my deflection function as Y, I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, and we know this is going to be a function of x1. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to take this q over here and I'm going to move it to the other side. So I'm going to have minus q. So how does that look for my deflection or sorry, my differential equation? Is there any problems with it in its current state? All right, so Dylan says the EI portion is wrong. And Jocelyn says we need to define EI. And you guys are completely correct in that. In the sense, since it's blue over here, we know that EI is not defined. However, we need to define EI. Well, EI is simple because it's just the two terms multiplied by each other. So the first one's E, which we defined as EM. And the second one is I, which we defined as IG. So now how, if we look at our differential equation now, and let's say that we run it, and I suppressed it so we didn't see anything, our only unknown is going to be that deflection function y. So is that what we want right now? Looking pretty good? All right, we got confirmation from Jocelyn. We're good to go. So let's solve this. So remember that we said we can solve differential equations using the desolve function. And the desolve function basically takes in three inputs. So I'm going to put two commas. So we have input one, input two, and input three. The first one is going to be what is our differential equation and what is it equal to? So we have DE and we know that this is equal to zero because I moved the Q already to the other side. It's going to be equal to zero. The second component is going to be, all right, well, what is the uh, function that we're trying to solve for? Well, we want to solve for y as a function of x1. And then the final one, of course, is going to be what is the variable? Well, we know that is simply x1. So how's that looking, you guys? If I were to solve this, am I, am I laughing? Do I have my deflection function? Let's just run it and check. Is this my deflection function? Are there any problems here? Any at all? <laughs> I mean, you guys are a little bit shy right now. So Johnson says boundary conditions, and that's completely correct. 
Because I didn't define any boundary conditions, my solution to this equation has C1, C2, C3, and C4. Those are coefficients that I solve for using boundary conditions. So if I have four coefficients here, C1, C2, C3, and C4, how many boundary conditions am I going to need to specify in this problem if I have four coefficients? You guys are a little unsure? Well, let's go through a couple of the boundary conditions and let's see what happens. So if we have something that both ends are fixed, the most obvious one, of course, is going to be that the deflection at both ends is going to be zero because both ends are fixed. So my first boundary condition is I'm going to say, all right, well, y, which is my deflection, at x1 is equal to zero, must, of course, be equal to zero. My second one, of course, is, well, on the other side of the beam, it's also fixed. So y, when x1 is equal to L, well, that deflection must also be 0. So I just define two boundary conditions. And if I run it, uh, we still got a problem. We still have a C2 and a C3. So we had four boundary, sorry, we had four coefficients. We defined two boundary conditions, and we still have two coefficients. So how many more boundary conditions do you think we need to solve this problem? Jocelyn says two, and she's completely correct. So here's the question for you guys. In both the simply supported case and the fixed end case, we know that deflection at both ends is going to be zero. It's going to be those second boundary conditions that define the simple case, or sorry, differentiate the, the simple case to the fixed end case. So if I'm looking at a fixed end case, can you guys give me a boundary condition that I can add to this for the fixed end? What do you guys think? What is one property of something that has a fixed end that we, we can use in here? For instance, if I wanted a simple case, I know that the moment at the support is going to be zero. However, for the fixed end case, we know that that moment will not be zero because there's going to be a reaction moment. However, we do know something about a fixed end case that'll make this really simple. So Dylan says y prime at zero is equal to zero. So if I were to go y prime at zero, oops, if I can type correctly, is equal to zero. And that's completely correct because y prime, that's the rotation. And we know that if something is fixed at the end, it's not going to rotate. And since both ends are fixed like this, we know that y prime at the other end, so y prime when x1 is equal to L, well, this, of course, will also be equal to zero. So now if I add in those two boundary conditions and I run it, I have my deflection function right here. And in this case, it's perfect because we don't have any C coefficients. It's simply a function of x1, which is exactly what I said that we should have. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into y, where y is equal to y of x1 when s of 1. So I'm just defining it here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot it. So you guys may be wondering what all this was. Well, I have the plots ready so I can show you guys really quick. So if we were to plot this deflection function that we're given, this is what we get. Does that look wrong to you guys? Our deflection's going upwards. There must be something wrong, because of course, when we load a beam, we don't expect it to start moving upwards. <laughs> Did we miss a negative? So here's our parameters, and let's go through them. Should our Young's modulus be negative? No, you guys are right. Young's modulus should not be negative. How about our dimensions of the beam? Should we have negative dimensions? Well, that one's easy. Of course not. Moments of inertia, well, that's based on dimensions. Of course not. So the only thing that we're left is Q. You guys think that Q should be negative? What happens if I put a negative? Let's just go negative and let's go enter. Is this the correct deflection now? Yes. So what happens is that Q, if we look at how we define things, our x2 axis is pointed upwards 
but of course our Q, our distributed load, is pointed downwards. So that's why we actually have a negative Q because it's a downwards distributed load. So that's another thing that'll start getting a lot of students. And this is why I recommend, even though the question doesn't ask for it, is simply plotting the function. Because if we plot it, then we could see that there was something wrong. If we didn't plot it and we just saw this equation, well, I guarantee that not a lot of students would be able to just look at this equation and go, wait a second, that's going upwards. We would just enter it into the assignment. We'd get it wrong, and then we'd message Clayton asking why we got it wrong when you were so confident. <laughs> All right. So now that we have our deflection function and it's looking good, we can use the relationships that we have down here to find both the shear and the moment. So let's start off with shear. We see that shear is simply going to be EI, EI multiplied by the third derivative of that deflection function. So of course in Mathematica we know we can find that third derivative using the D function and the D function takes in two inputs. So the first input is what is going to be the function I want to differentiate? Well we know that's going to be Y and the second input is what variable are we differentiating with respect to? Well we know that's going to be X1. So is this good to go? We have our EI, we have our derivative. It seems like it should be pretty good. Are we pretty confident that this will give me the right shear? All right, well, let's try something. Maybe this will help you guys. So what I'm going to do is, again, I have the plot for the shear as well as the equation for the shear. So Dylan says it needs to be the third derivative, and you guys are correct. So again, if we were to plot this, this would be our shear diagram, which we know is a bunch of crap because, of course, if our uh, distributed load is constant, we expect a linear shear diagram. So what I'm going to do up here is Dylan said that, yes, it needs to be the third derivative. So this right now will only take the derivative once. If we want to modify it to take more than one derivative, what we do in our second input, we put squiggle brackets. So we still have our x1, but then we define how many times we want to take that derivative. So in the shear case, we want to take it three times. So all I did was add a squiggle brackets around x1, and I put comma three to mean I'm taking this derivative three times. And now when I run it, I have my nice linear shear and I have my equation. So now it's looking good to go. And I can do the same thing for the moment where my moment here is going to be EI multiplied by the second derivative of that deflection function. So again, first input, what am I uh, taking the derivative of? Well, that's going to be Y. And the second one is going to be with respect to what variable? Of course, X1 and how many times? Well, for the moment, we only do it twice. I can suppress that, and what I did is I also have the moment plot ready to go. We come down here, and this makes perfect sense, because we know that for a beam with two fixed ends, we should have a negative moment around the supports, which we see here, and then we have a positive moment at the midspan, and of course our function is parabolic, which makes sense. It should be one order higher than the shear function. So this is how we do part, uh, part A of the question, and again, part uh, B, C, and D, for the stress components, it's quite simple now that we know both V and we know M. We just have to plug and chug it into the formulas. We don't even really have to worry about any derivatives, so it's good to go. So this is it for question number one. Is there any questions about question number one? And again, if you guys are curious about the stress components, I do go over them in my assignment guide video. So there is resources out there in case you guys are struggling. All right, I'll take that as you guys are pretty happy, so we can get rid of this. And uh, sure, we'll save it, why not? Exit out of Mathematica. Where's my PowerPoint? Let's go on to question number two. So question number one is actually the longer of the two. Once you guys get question number one, question number two will go pretty smoothly. But question number two does have one trick that we're going to talk about. All right, so looking at question number two, it says the shown beam has a rectangular cross-sectional area with a constant width of 225 millimeters. So if you guys actually look at the beam, it's very similar to what you guys had in assignment number five, but it's a little bit easier because in assignment number five, both the height of the beam and the width varied. Now only the height varies while the width is kept constant. 
It says the height of the beam varies linearly along its length from 714 millimeters at x2 is equal to 0 to 487 millimeters at x2 is equal to L. The Young's modulus of the beam is 20 GPA and the effect of Poisson's ratio can be ignored. If P is equal to 120 kilonewtons, Q is equal to 11 kilonewtons per meter, Rho, the density, is equal to 8,475 kilonewtons per meter cubed, the length L is equal to 9 meters, and G is equal to 10 meters per second squared determined and it basically wants three things. Now, part A here is mainly just theory. So in your guys' assignment, part A which should just be easy plug and chug. We don't actually have to solve for anything. It is going to be part B and part C that we're actually going to have to use Mathematica to solve for. So part A says the displacement vector, the position vector, and the strain tensor as functions of ui and xi. And that's how we know it's easy because in terms of ui and xi, it's simple. We don't have to figure out what ui and xi are. We just have to input them as ui and xi. And we're going to talk about that in the theory, so part A is not a problem. Where it starts to become a problem is part B, where it wants that displacement function u2 as a function of x2. And again, it wants it in a value of meters, so we're going to have to keep that in mind when we define our units. And then we're going to wrap it up with part C, which says the axial stress sigma 2 2 as a function of x2. So if we think back to assignment 5, we basically solved part C where we found that axial stress. But now we're taking it a step further and saying, all right, well, how about the displacement as a function of x2? So let's look at how we do that. So the first one is going to be our deformation assumption. And this is going to be critical in allowing us to solve this problem fairly simply. So under loads, the beam is assumed to deform such that the vertical displacement is a smooth function. Now, if it's a smooth function, that's great for us because we can find our position vector as follows, where it's going to be x1, x2 plus u2. And that makes sense because that means that there is going to be some displacement in the u2 direction and then simply x3. So in part A of your guys' question where it asks for the position vector, there you guys go. Again, it's nice and easy. Now. Since we know that position vector, we can easily find the displacement vector because we know the formula. The displacement vector u is simply x minus big X. Well, if we look at the top, x1 minus x1, that's going to be 0. x2 plus u2 minus x2, well, that's just going to be u2. And then finally, x3 minus x3, that's going to be 0. And this makes sense because if we have a beam that's vertical and we're strictly just pulling it downwards while ignoring Poisson's ratio, it's just going to move in that vertical direction. It's not going to move in any other direction. And again, this is because we're ignoring the effect of Poisson's ratio. If we include it, well, this becomes a lot more complex. But thankfully, we don't have to worry about it right now. Now, if we were to move forward, we say, all right, well, now that we know the displacement function, of course, I can easily figure out the displacement gradient. And in turn, I can find that strain tensor. So if I do that, I get this, where my strain tensor is basically going to be a bunch of zeros with the only exception being uh, epsilon 2, 2, which is equal to the derivative of that displacement function u2 with respect to x2. So again, if we're looking at part A of your guys' question, it all can be solved right here nice and easily. You guys shouldn't have a problem. It's going to be part B that's going to get a little bit tricky. So if we come down over here and say, all right, well, for part, for part B, it wants that displacement function. Now, there's a good and a bad side of this. The good side is if we have a beam under axial load in this course, we're always going to go back to this differential equation. So again, I would recommend writing this down. And if you guys are in an exam type scenario where you guys see uh, a beam under an axial load, you guys can just whip out this equation. You guys will be good to go. Now, the problem with this equation is that we have a D over dx term on the outside of our three variables. And those three variables being the Young's modulus E, the area A, and then the derivative of our displacement function. Now, our displacement function we know is going to be a function of x. So that will be something we have to consider. It's going to be E and A that we're really going to have to look at. Because if E and A are both a function of x, well, then this is going to get really messy. So let's look at our specific scenario to see what it looks like. Well, we're given that E is constant, which is great. That means that we don't have to really worry about it when we're taking derivatives. However, our area varies over the length of our beam. Therefore, that area will be a function of x2, and this will create a little bit of problems, as we'll see. So since both a and u are functions of x2, if we want to take the derivative of ea du dx, we're going to have to actually apply the product rule. And that, again, that's because both our a 
and our u is a function of x. So if we do that, our differential equation turns into this, where we have ea multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function, plus e multiplied by the derivative of our area function, multiplied by the derivative of our displacement function, and then plus p. All right, so it doesn't look too bad. Let's take it a step further and really apply this to our problem. So can we solve this? Well, in order to solve this, we need only one unknown because we have one equation. So the simple things, we know what E is, we're given that. We can figure out what A is because we're given all the information we need for A. And if we figure out A, well, then we can simply take the derivative to find DA with respect to DX2. Now the question becomes, what is this P? at the outside. So here's the trick for a lot of students. This P is what I like to call the total distributed load. So that means both the applied loads as well as the effects of self weight. So if I were to expand this out, I can say that well, we actually do know P because P is going to be equal to our distributed load Q, which is our applied distributed load, plus the self weight, which is going to be rho G multiplied by A. So that's going to be one thing. We know that P is actually Q plus rho G A. And again, we know all the components in there. Therefore, the only thing that we don't know is going to be our displacement function. However, of course, being a differential equation, we have a problem. So in this case, if we solve for that displacement function, we'll have it as a function of X2, which is great. That's what we want. But we have two unknown coefficients, C1 and C2. And since we have two coefficients, therefore we need two boundary conditions for this problem. So let's try and figure out what those will be. If we look at our nice picture here, it's fairly obvious for the first boundary condition, we can see that at x2 is equal to zero, it's fixed there. And if it's fixed, well, we know that the displacement there is going to be equal to zero. So I can circle this and say, all right, I already have one boundary condition. So the problem becomes now, well, what is going to be that second boundary condition? Well, we know at the bottom end that we have our axial load P and we know the area there. Therefore, we know the stress at the very end of the beam where the stress at X is equal to L. So sigma 2, 2 at L is equal to P divided by A when X2 is equal to L. And although this sounds great, this actually won't work. Again, because we're solving an equation for the displacement, or the yeah displacement, we need a displacement boundary condition. So what we're going to have to do is use some of the relationships that we know. So for a linear elastic isotropic material, we know that U prime at L is actually equal to the strain at L. Now the strain, since it's linear elastic stuff like that, we know that the strain is simply going to be the stress divided by the Young's modulus, and we actually know what the stress is. So we know that the strain of L or U prime at L is going to be equal to P divided by the Young's modulus E multiplied by A when X2 is equal to L. And this will be our second boundary condition. So now that we have two boundary conditions, we can actually solve for our displacement function. So that would be part B. Moving on to part C, it wants our axial stress. Well, again, this is pretty easy because from the relationship that we used in the boundary conditions, we know that sigma 2, 2 is simply going to be our Young's modulus times the strain, which is going to be equal to E multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to x2. And since we know what u is at this point, this is nice and simple. So we're good to go. So again, another Mathematica type of question. So what we're going to do, of course, is define those parameters. Then we're going to determine that cross-sectional area. And then from there, we can solve our differential equation for the displacement. Now, unlike before, where we had two steps, this one actually has three. So the first one is going to be define our differential equation. The second one is to find the boundary conditions, which is exactly the same as before. But however, in this particular problem, we're going to have to define the domain. And as you were going to see in Mathematica, I'll show you guys exactly why we need to do this. Finally, after we have our displacement function U2, we can simply determine the axial stress. So after we do all these steps, we'll have completely solved the question, which is great. So now let's jump into Mathematica and see exactly what this looks like. So just going to open Mathematica. I'm going to pull out our things here. We're going to go question two. So here we go. So the parameters, we've already discussed these a lot in question number one, so we don't really need to worry about uh, asking you guys too much about them. Our Young's modulus, 20 GPA. Well, we know that's going to be 20 uh, billion pascals. So 20, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. The length of the beam we were given as 9 meters, so that's simply going to be 9. The base of the beam, or the width of the beam into the page, that's 225 millimeters, but of course we want it in meters, so I'm going to divide by 1,000. 
And the same goes for h1 and h2. So h1 is the height at x is equal to 0. And h2 is going to be the height at x is equal to l, which is 487 millimeters divided by 1,000. Now p, our axial load at the end of the beam, is 120 kilonewtons. Well, of course, we know we want things in newtons. So I'm going to put my extra three zeros to convert to newtons. Uh, Q, which is our dense, uh, sorry, our distributed load is 11 kilonewtons per meters, but I want this in newtons per meters, so we times by a thousand. And then row G, which I do kind of in a single step, I just go the density, which is 8, 4, 7, 5, multiplied by 10. And I do this in one step just to not have so many parameters. So again, I kind of rushed through this a little bit. This is something that we talked about in question number one. You guys will be good to go. Now, the cross-sectional area, this is where things will become a problem because we know that it is linear uh, throughout the beam because of that changing height. So what we do know is that for a rectangular beam, it's going to be height times the base. This is what we do know. Luckily for us, our base is constant, so I can leave that there. However, our height actually changes. So we can't just put height. We have to put in our equation for the height. Luckily for us, we know it's nice and linear, so it's going to have the form of y is equal to m x, which we know in this case is x2, plus b, and this is not the same b, this is like the equation for y equals mx plus b. So we know that b is going to be the area at x is equal to 0, which we know is going to be h1, and m is going to be that slope. So m is what's going to try and get a lot of students, because we know that it's going to be the rise over the run. So if I'm going the rise, well, that's h1 minus h2. And the run of this is over the length of the beam L. So what do you guys think? Did I do this correctly? I know it was a lot to take in. I did a little bit fast, but uh, I'll give you guys a hint. This is for sure correct. But is my slope correct? Let's, let's put it that way. Is my slope correct for this beam? Let's put it this way. If I were to run this really quick, I have my area as always increasing. But yes, as Dylan says, the heights are backwards. And again, it's easy to see because my area is always increasing. We know that it's actually the opposite where the height is actually decreasing as we go through x2. And now we're good to go. So that's my area function. I also said that I need my differential of that area function. So I can go dA is simply equal to the derivative. And again, what function do I want to take the derivative of? That's going to be A. And the second part is, what variable do I want to take that with respect to? Well, that's going to be x2. So if I run that out, I'm good to go. I have my dA as a negative number, which is expected. So now that I have all these, I can actually go down and try and solve this differential equation. So the first thing I do is I'm going to define it. I'm going to have dE is equal to the Young's modulus multiplied by A multiplied by the second derivative of our displacement function, which we know is a function of x2. So again, that's just our first part right here, not too bad. And we know, well, we multi sorry, we add this to our modulus multiplied by dA multiplied by the first derivative of our deflection function. So u prime of x2. Now again, this p right here, this is our total distributed load. So this is our applied load plus self-weight. So we know that our applied load is going to be q. And then our self-weight is rho g multiplied by a. So this is our differential equation. I'll just tell you guys right now it is correct because we're running a little bit short on time. So we're going to move forward a little bit faster. So if I want to solve this, again, I use my nice trusty D solve function. And again, it's going to take in three arguments. So the first one, what is your differential equation and what is it equal to? Well, our differential equation we defined as DE. And we know that bad boy is going to be equal to zero. The second thing is what function are we trying to solve for? Well, we want to solve for u as a function of x1. And then the final part is going to be, all right, what is the variable? Well, we know that's actually x2, and I need to switch that over there. So just like before, if we were to solve this, we have our boundary condition problem. So we have C2 and C1. However, we talked about this. We know what our two are. We know that u at 0 is actually equal to 0 because there's no displacement. And then we know that u prime at a value of L is equal to what I call BC end. And I haven't defined BCN. So one of the things I need to do is I need to define it. So my boundary condition at the end, we said, is going to be P divided by the Young's modulus, EM, times A, 
specifically when x2 is equal to L. So I'm just going to put this in here. Now we're good to go. Now if I solve this equation, we should in theory be good to go. So if I solve it, well, hold on a second, we have a problem. Because if we look right here, we have that I. And that I right there means that we have an imaginary solution, which is a problem to you guys because, of course, we should not have an imaginary solution. And the reason why is because of this changing area. Of course, in our length of the beam from 0 to x is equal to L, the area will always be positive. But if we're trying to find a differential equation that goes from 0 all the way to, say, infinity, well, there's a point here where this area will actually become negative, And that's why we have a nice imaginary solution. So what we're going to have to do is actually define the domain, and that's what I wanted to get to here. So after we do our solve function, everything stays the same, but after x2, we actually input a fourth argument, and that argument is called assumptions. So normally you guys don't like to make assumptions, but in this case we kind of have to. So we go assumptions, approach, and then basically what we're going to do is we're going to input the domain that we're interested in, which is going to be 0 is greater than or equal to x2, or less than or equal to, I don't know how it goes, <laughs> and this is equal to L. So now we're only considering the solution of this equation between x is equal to 0 to x is equal to L. So now if I run it, as we can see, we have no more i, we actually have a nice displacement function. So if I want to, I can define that as u is equal to u as a, sorry, x2, oops. <laughs> All right, hold on guys, I got this. All right, when s at once. Now if I run it, I got this, but of course you guys don't want to input that into your assignment. So if we want to, we can simply expand it and we'll have something like this. And again, that's pretty gross. So if we want to, we can even full simplify it and then expand it. Not much nicer, but it looks a little bit better. And that's it. So once we have that displacement function u, we can find that stress component simply s22 is equal to our modulus multiplied, oops, by that derivative of our displacement function u. So I want u with respect to x2. I can do something like that to get my s22. And that's it for the question. So again, the big problem here, make sure you guys define that domain. If you guys don't define the domain, you guys will have an imaginary solution. Of course, you guys don't want an imaginary solution. But that's it for the question. As you guys will see, the code required isn't that bad. So I see that I went a little bit over my time. I apologize for that. Is there any questions about this assignment? Again, I hope it should be nice and easy for you guys because I know you guys are so busy.